Hello and welcome to New Frontiers on CCTV International. I'm Ji Xiaojun in Beijing, and today we are continuing with our major series about Chinese Kung Fu. In this program, we'll hear more about one of the most important schools of martial arts in China, Wu Dang Kung Fu. Now, there are several unique aspects to Wu Dang Kung Fu, which is commonly known as Nei Jia Boxing, and these set it apart from other schools. For one thing, it's based on Taoist principles. So Nei Jia Boxing uses soft tactics to overcome hard and stillness to overcome motion. Thus, it enables the weak to defeat the strong. As you might imagine, there are many fascinating stories told about the masters of Nei Jia Boxing. Lao Tzu stated, nothing should be done without reserve, and it is the same with Kung Fu moves, whether weapons are used or not. Any move, if executed with reserve, will land the person executing it in an awkward position. In Lao Tzu's philosophy, letting things take their own course and being detached from worldly strife are regarded as virtues. And these two tenets of Taoism are seen in Kung Fu. A Kung Fu practitioner must practice fine virtues. He must never give up on anything or attract attention on purpose. Traditional Chinese Kung Fu values skills, not merely winning a fight through physical strength. Taoists practiced Kung Fu not to fight one another, but to defend themselves against the wild beasts inhabiting the forests where they meditated, or to fight off bandits when traveling on foot. But they also practiced Kung Fu in the hope of achieving harmony and merging with nature, which was their ultimate objective. Taoist Jia seldom leaves Mount Wudang. Apart from daily classes and ceremonies and prostrating himself before the statue of the god of Jen Wu, twice every day at midnight and at noon, he engages in sitting meditation. During this meditation, he practices internal work, which means taking in the fresh and expelling the stale in order to guide qi inside his body. Taking in the fresh and getting rid of the stale is called Tu Na by Taoists while guiding qi inside the body for circulation at will is called Dao Yin. Together, they are used to cultivate internal vital energy, and this is very important in the life of a Taoist. Chinese历史源源很久远的这个内丹术，它更强调的是什么呢？内气的服饰，内气的吐纳。内气的流转周流内气的运用所以这个古代的内丹术呢在我所知道我所跟一些武术名家或内丹修炼者的这个请教当中啊知道像内家拳呢练到高层境界的时候他就应该与这个内丹术的修炼相通相近了他在低层次在中间层次可能还到不了这个体会不到这种东西但是到往高层次追求内家武功的时候他离不开内丹的思想 Internal Qi 
is attained by adjusting breathing and regulating internal channels, and Taoists integrate this with their Kung Fu practice. The cultivation of internal qi initiated by Taoists was later adopted widely by Kung Fu practitioners. Taoists believed that acquiring qi from nature to replenish one's own and making it circulate at will inside the body through unblocked channels to reach every part of the body was a magic weapon that could be used to overcome a rival.对内地的这个修炼包括所谓的这个少林外家练到高层境界同样有这些东西这不只是内家所独有但是是内家所推崇 long cherished the wish to cut into a cliff face to form a cave that would be totally inaccessible to anyone else he uses his cave as the place to practice internal qi to Zhong, such a location is ideal, as he knows well that in ancient times people use such isolated sites to improve their Kung Fu skills. In such a place free from distractions, one can make great progress by concentrating the mind on just one outcome, improving one's vital energy and with it, one's Kung Fu skills. So we have a lot of people who have a lot of money. They 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 have a lot of money. 那稍不注意可能就会有粉身最苦的威胁,所以他注意力非常集中,他不敢想别的东西。西是不敢想,在的时间长了是自然不想了。Nate Boxing was born out of Taoist beliefs, but it wasn't just this philosophical basis that was the source of its development. Another key factor was the Wudang Mountain's special status during the Ming Dynasty. But back to the Qin and Han dynasties more than 2,000 years ago. Some Taoists on Mount Wudang worked hard to become immortal. The weather on the mountain never went to extremes and fully one third of the medicinal herbs described in the classical book Compendium of Materia Medica could be found on the mountain. This place, cut off from the outside world, naturally became seen by Taoists as an ideal place to practice their meditation. Shaolin Temple on the Central Plain, on the other hand, was dragged repeatedly into wars, particularly during the Ming Dynasty when the temple's monk soldiers were called upon to do service for the Ming government. The fact was, the Kung Fu fighting prowess of the Shaolin monks had aroused much attention from the court, and so the monk soldiers were sent again and again as a special force to fight for the empire. Compared with the monks of Shaolin Temple, the Taoists on Mount Wudang were fortunate, as a stone bearing an edict of the emperor prohibiting the recruitment of Taoist monks as soldiers confirms. The decree on the stone reads, let them be undisturbed in their meditation. Ming emperors valued Taoism more than any previous rulers, and they even gave Taoists lands to be farmed for them by hired peasants. Being so amply supplied, the Taoists on Wudang were able to concentrate on their techniques, and this made it possible for Nei Jia Boxing to progress rapidly. Yeah. 
Today, Taoist Jung Yun Lung likes to teach students in some quiet, secluded spot. But in ages past, Nei Jia boxing was taught only among Taoists and never to outsiders. While this age-old rule imbued this boxing style with an air of mystery, it also meant it was little known to non-Taoists or anyone else outside of the mountain. When the Ming Dynasty was succeeded by China's last dynasty, the Qing Dynasty, the new dynasty brought with it new cultural beliefs which had a major impact on Taoism, a philosophical tradition of the majority Han people. To the new regime, the royal temple of the Ming Dynasty meant nothing, and under the new government, Taoists were no longer privileged. To make a living, many had no choice but to leave the mountain, but there was a positive side effect. Inevitably, their Nei Jia Kung Fu, along with its theories and tactics, spread into the world outside the mountain. The three most famous schools, Tai Ji, Form and Will, and Eight Trigram Palm Boxing, the three children of Nei Jia Kung Fu, were about to establish themselves in the world of Kung Fu. The great masters of these styles were yet to arise, and their stories were yet to be told. But in due course they would appear, and future generations would hear of them and learn of them. Nei Jia Kung Fu, one of the most famous styles, uses soft tactics to overcome the heart and stillness to overcome motion, and in so doing, it enables the weak to overcome the strong. However, some people believe that this school of Kung Fu is too soft and insubstantial for use in real combat situations. However, Nei Jia is the parent style of no less than three important schools of Kung Fu. Tai Ji, known throughout the world, Xing Yi, meaning form and will, and Eight Trigram Palm. In the later years of the Qing Dynasty and early years of the Republic, these three schools came to be recognized as having reached the highest level in Chinese Kung Fu. Each of the three had its own legendary masters, about whom there were many fascinating stories. Among the three, Tai Ji is regarded as the most representative of the parent style Nei Jia. Today people are still divided about exactly when Tai Ji first appeared, but no matter when it was, today millions of people around the world practice it. Among all the theories put forward about its origins, one thing is beyond dispute. The birth of Tai Ji was related to a famous boxer named Yang Lu Chan, who was said to have learned the technique by stealing it from someone else. Yang was born into a very poor family in present-day Hebei province, and from a very early age, he began to practice Kung Fu. By the time he was an adult, he was very good at own style boxing. But it was an event that took place in front of a pharmacy that was to shape the course of his life. Using only what was described as a very slight move of a finger, the owner of the pharmacy threw a big, strong troublemaker to the ground and forced him to beat a fast retreat. Yang was impressed, and he soon learnt that the owner was from a village called Chen Jiago in Hunan province. He also learnt that this Kung Fu was called soft boxing, or what we call today Tai Chi. Astonished by what he had witnessed, Yang Lu Chen decided to make his way to Chen Jiago to learn this incredible style of Kung Fu. The village of Chen Jiago in today's Wenxian County in Hunan province has been a cradle of numerous Kung Fu masters. Even today, most of the residents of the village, some of them young and others older than 70, 
can do Kung Fu very well. In the village, Yan Lu Chen located its most famous boxer, a man named Chen Chang Xin. Chen Changxing was tall and strong and possessed Kung Fu skills that seemed unfathomable. When he attended a theatre performance or went to a temple fair, he wouldn't budge an inch even when a huge crowd was pressing him from behind. Not surprisingly, people called him Mr. Rock. But where did this Chen Changxing learn Taiji? People are divided on this point as well. Some feel it likely that Taiji was not native to the village, while others think it probable that Chen inherited it from his ancestors. But whatever the case, all agree that Chen is the earliest recorded practitioner of Taiji, and it has been impossible to trace its history to anyone before him. Well, today we can still see the yard where Yang Luchan learned Taiji. At first, Chen Changxing refused to teach him, and it is because of this that the story about Yang stealing Taiji arose. The truth, however, is rather different. All Kung Fu masters were very picky when it came to choosing students, as following the teachings that went with all schools of Kung Fu, only the virtuous, smart and quick-minded could qualify. Yang came twice to Chen Changxing and twice he was refused. But undeterred, he asked Chen a third time and this time Chen decided to determine whether Yang was a suitable candidate. He asked Yang Lu Chen to come to a quiet room for a talk, and Yang showed up punctually, only to see Chen seated comfortably in a chair, eyes closed at rest. Yang didn't disturb him, but stood to one side with all respect. After a long while, Chen opened his eyes and then simply said to Yang, it's too late, come tomorrow at the same time. The next day and the day after the same thing happened. In fact, several days passed like this, but Yang did not become frustrated. Eventually, Chen was moved by the young man's determination and he decided to teach him all he knew. Three years later, the teacher said to Yang, you may leave because you have no match in this place.这个说明什么呢？内家拳，具体说，太极拳，它的修炼是很不容易的。即便你是很聪明的人，即便你是很用功夫，它真的需要相当的悟性，还有老师给你喂劲儿，你才懂劲儿。懂劲儿后，愈
family owned a famous shop in Peking that sold pickles, and its owner, known as Fat John, even supplied one of the royal princes with his product and maintained a close relationship with the prince's family. With the power of the family of a prince backing him up, Fat Zhang was regarded in the city as untouchable. Yang Lushan to Zhang Jia, ah, Zhang Jia, this owner, ah, is this Dong Jia, also did not look at him. He was very patient. Yang Lushan, ah, was once in this restaurant, ah, and he showed his talent. Finally, he defeated these people. 这些人，最后才扎下根来。这些东西呢，有很多传说、轶事和演绎，我们也无法一一的去考证。但有一一个东西是，杨露禅被近代武术史称为“杨无敌”，号称“杨无敌”，一生与人交手无数，据说无有败绩。After the legendary incident at the dinner table. Yang began not only to teach the children of the Zhang family reading and writing, he also began teaching various members of the family Kung Fu. As it happened, the butler of Prince Duan was a great, almost fanatical, lover of Kung Fu, and at the recommendation of Fat Zhang, Yang was employed by the prince as a Kung Fu coach. Being employed by a prince of the empire naturally helped to spread Yang's name far and wide. Before long, even Kung Fu masters were paying him visits. With his legendary Tai Ji Kung Fu, Yang won the name Invincible. Actually, this Wu Shu, ah, in this civil society, ah, the Wulin's rights, ah, it should include a lot of meanings. 一个意思呢是要交流，叫世纪，就是我在门内，因为知道学拳的人先是在门内学，跟师傅学，跟师叔学，跟师兄弟交流。然后他到外边去访拳呢，他有世纪的意思，试试自己的东西练到了什么样的程度，这有这一层意思。还有一个，他要想于此以此来这个谋生吃饭，他要扬名。他要在世纪的过程当中较量，是吧？赢了别人，然后他才能够扬名，是吧？这个当然还有一个最本质的原因，就是交流。人精三十五一高，人必须有见识。武术这个东西是要切身体会、体体会实战的，它不是纸上谈兵，所以他在外边这种呃访权本身的过程。也是多闻、多看、多体会的一个过程。Among all the stories about Yang Lu Chen, the following is the most famous. One day, while resting, Yang Lu Chen was expecting a visit from a monk who was coming to compare notes. The visitor was very tall and very strong and quite impressive looking. When he arrived, Yang Lu Chen came out of the house to greet him. Greeted Yang with all courtesy, and then Yang invited him in to his living room for a chat. All of a sudden, however, the monk launched a blow aimed at Yang Lu Chan's chest. Yang contracted his chest a little, used his right arm to fend off the blow, and with a gentle push, the monk was sent flying. He dropped to the ground. As if downed by a heavy blow, it was quite some time before the monk regained his breath. And when he did, he readily admitted his defeat. He said he was very curious about the type of kung fu Yang had just applied. The great fame Yang Lu Chan eventually enjoyed was closely associated with his experiences after mastering Tai Chi. His special position in the Imperial Army naturally helped to spread Yang's name far and wide. Before long, other Kung Fu masters were seeking him out. Some would challenge him, and using his legendary Tai Chi Kung Fu, Yang beat them all. Thus, he became known as Yang the Invincible. 
In our next program, we'll hear more stories about Chinese Kung Fu. So please tune in again. And thank you for staying with us on today's New Frontiers. I'm Ji Xiaojun from CCTV International. Goodbye.